So, hello. Now, when I wrote the talk that I gave for the last year at Event Part, grid layout was still a hopeful, coming soon feature. And those of us that had been working with CSS Grid for a while, we were pretty sure it was going to ship into browsers in 2017. We just didn't know when exactly and which browsers. It looked pretty definite that we were going to get it in Chrome and probably Firefox. But what about Safari? We knew the code was ready. It was written by the same people who'd written the code for Chrome. But whether Apple was going to ship it or not, well, we didn't know that. And then in March 2017, Firefox, and then Chrome, then Safari, including iOS Safari, they all shipped grid layout within a couple of weeks of each other, which was fantastic. And of course, then we all gave Edge the side eye. And then just recently with Edge 16, they have updated their implementation. So Edge now also has CSS grid layout. This enormous spec is now available for us to use in all of the mainstream production browsers. And I'm very happy about that. It means that I wasn't going around for five years talking about CSS vaporware. But on a few podcasts and things that I've done since, I've been asked quite frequently you know, what it was like to see that be shipped, having worked and, and sort of played around with it and taught people it for over five years. And this is the thing, you know, while I'd been going around and telling people about Grid and showing examples and trying to get people excited and trying to ensure that it did get into browsers, I would not built a production website in it, and neither had anybody else. And within three months of Grid getting out into some of those browsers, we were seeing on some sites 70% of users had CSS Grid support. Uh, I've got a site which has nearly 90%. And all of a sudden, it wasn't just Jen Simmons and I talking about Grid. It seemed like everybody was talking about Grid. And my inbox kind of exploded because people realized they needed to know about this. And you know, prior to launch, I was getting you know, a couple of emails a week. Someone would ask a question. I'd answer it. That was fine. And I suddenly discovered I was being absolutely bombarded with email about CSS Grid layout. And I couldn't really do any work if I answered all of these things. But looking at those emails, it kind of told me a few things about how people were feeling about this. People were really excited. They'd seen it. They'd realized it would be a game changer. And you know, they were really excited to start using it in their work. A lot of people were also very confused. They had an idea what grid layout was going to be. And they've started using it. And it wasn't quite what they thought. And there were also quite a lot of people who seemed quite scared. I'd get emails saying, I've just learned Flexbox. You know, like, we've brought this new thing out, and do I need to learn it? There's so much to learn. And when I was putting together this talk, I did a bit of a survey, and I sort of asked people, you know, I asked people a bunch of questions. And towards the end, I asked this, how do you feel when you see a new CSS feature announced? And among the responses were things like this, you know, worried about falling behind. That was a really common theme. And this seemed quite sad, you know, excited. And then I share it with my colleagues, and they pick it apart. And oh, no, a new way to have inconsistencies between web browsers. And then just tired. <laughs> and you know, I think probably all of us can sometimes identify with that feeling, you know, feeling overwhelmed. There's all this new stuff that I'm expected to learn. You know, being tired, perhaps getting excited about new things, and then being knocked down. And the other thing that happened is I get a bunch of people emailing me, basically asking me to rubber stamp their choices. They're saying, if I do this in this way, is that the right thing to do? Can you tell me that I'm doing the right thing? And I can't do that, because unless I was there in your team with your code base looking at your problems, I can't tell you whether you should implement Grid or how you should implement Grid. But I think I can probably help you to go one better than that. And what I want to do is help people go one better than that. What I can tell you is you can get to a point where you don't need someone like me to rubber stamp your choices, where you can feel confident in your plans. And even more importantly, you can explain those plans to other people so you don't get knocked down by clients or other people on your team. And that's exactly where you want to be with any technology. You don't want to be asking for permission to use stuff from me or for anybody else. So how do we get there? And that's kind of what this talk is about. It's about grid and about new layout, obviously. 
but it's about routes to navigate real understanding of these things so that you can run with this stuff and use it in the way that's appropriate for your projects or not use it when it's not appropriate. And I'm going to give you a bunch of useful code that hopefully will be helpful, and all of the code in this talk is online, so you can have a look at it and play with it. But what I really want you to take away is an understanding that you can be the amazing layout person on your team. So let's get started. And there's the bad news. You do need to understand CSS. There are no shortcuts. There's no ability to kind of you know, get past the fact you need to understand some of the core underpinnings of the language. And that doesn't mean becoming a walking encyclopedia of properties. I can promise you that I'm not. I'm on the CSS working group. I know the layout stuff very, very well. But there are parts of CSS if I have to use, for instance, animations and so on. I have to look that stuff up every single time because I don't remember it, because I don't do it enough. So looking up properties and values, that's not quite enough, though. You, know, you can find all of this stuff on the internet. But if you are just looking stuff up, it's a bit like if you're learning a new foreign language and you've learned a bit of vocabulary, and you can go to another country and you can sort of announce stuff at people. You can sort of announce coffee and you'll get coffee. But you can't really have a conversation because you haven't got the grammar and the structure of how things are put together. And it's the same with CSS. You can know a bit of syntax, you can know how to apply CSS to stuff, and you're going to get something that kind of works. But without an understanding of the core underpinnings of the language, it's never really going to flow. And you're going to end up in corners that you can't really figure out. And so what are those core things you need to know about CSS that you kind of really need to internalize so that you can then just look up the other bits as and when you need them? I think a lot of people already know this stuff, but maybe don't quite have the language for it yet. They kind of know certain things happen, but they don't know why, and they can't look up those reasons because they haven't got the right words. And so I'm going to be using the kind of real technical words for this stuff because I want you to be able to go to the specs and actually look up for yourself how this stuff works. But we're going to start at the beginning. Because love it or hate it, the first word in cascading style sheets is cascading. It's important. You need to know how it works and what it means. The fact that styles cascade, it means you can declare a font on the body element, and all of the elements inside also get that same font. You don't have to add it to absolutely everything. And you can't talk about the cascade and inheritance without encountering its specificity. Because in a situation where several rules could affect the same thing, specificity says which one wins. That's what it's about. And I'm not going to head down a rabbit hole of explaining all of this stuff today, but if you're a bit fuzzy with how this works, if you sometimes end up sticking important on stuff to make sure that it overrides other things and you can't quite work out what's applying, spend a little bit of time. This is a really good uh, document on the MDN site, which just explains how that all works. It's really worth your time. It won't take you long to go through. And this is becoming very important. Block and inline dimensions. When I'm talking about Flexbox and Grid, I talk about the two axes along which your content can run. And we talk about Flexbox being one-dimensional and Grid being two-dimensional. And those axes, they correspond to the block and inline dimensions. So if you're in a writing system which has a horizontal writing mode, so that it doesn't matter whether the text is left to right, like in English, or right to left, like in Arabic, the inline dimension is along the rows of text, from left to right or right to left. And the block dimension runs down the page, top to bottom. And so you'll sometimes see mention of the inline or block axis when you're working with grid and flexbox, and that's what it means. If something's being aligned on the block axis, then, and you're in a horizontal writing mode, then that's the one the blocks go down the page on. So that's the block axis. But if we were working in a document with a vertical writing mode, then the inline direction would be top to bottom, and the block dimension would run horizontally. In grid layout, the inline axis is sometimes described as the row axis and the block axis as the column axis. Flex layout is actually a bit more complicated. And if you're struggling to understand alignment, it's often easier to understand it in grid layout than flexbox. Because in flexbox, we have a flex direction of row or column. And so in flexbox, we tend to refer to the main and the cross axis, because we're only working with one axis at a time. 
So the main axis is the one that's dictated by the flex direction. If you say flex direction rho, then that's the main axis. If you say flex direction column, then column is the main axis. And then the cross axis runs across that in whichever direction you, that it will be because that's the opposite to that. And the reason we don't say top to bottom and left to right, hopefully obvious in the way I introduce this topic, the inline axis only runs left to right if we're working in a language that runs left to right. The block axis only runs top to bottom in a horizontal writing mode. So all of our new CSS methods kind of understand that the world is not just one writing mode. And this is kind of different to what came before. And so this idea of constantly working with the axis that you're on rather than thinking about you know, top to bottom and left to right is really important and is where I think a lot of confusion lies. Now, I think 2018 is probably going to become the year of how big is that box? Because something that's become very obvious to me is that no one really understands how big anything is in the sort of new layout that we've got. People don't understand what the natural or intrinsic size of things on a web page are. And this really matters because we're moving from a world where we controlled the size of things and lined them up to one where we can let the content work out sizing for us. So this is what I mean. Um, if you were going to create a grid out of floats, so something that um, Bootstrap, when it used floats, did, or Foundation, uh, or if you just created a, you know, creating a grid-type layout out of floats, you need to do something like this. So this is very simplified, but this is what a float-based grid system does. Uh, even these things, you add classes or, or what have you. You give everything a percentage, including the gaps between the items, and then we add up those percentages if we want things to span multiple tracks. So we work out the size of the columns plus any gutter, and we stick that percentage into the CSS. Now, as long as our percentages don't get bigger than 100%, and we have a wrapper around our rows so things don't hop up into the next row, we'll get something that looks like a grid. And looks like a grid is the key thing. We haven't got a grid. What we've done is we've lined things up. We've given them a size, and we've lined them up so they look like they're a grid in our design. And percentages are pretty ugly, and they're not really very fun to calculate, but they are kind of consistent. We understand them. We know that if we get more than 100%, bad things are going to happen. And as we're doing the work to figure this stuff out, we've kind of got control. We know exactly what we're putting where in our layout and how big it is. And the thing with new layout, and one of the sort of standout features and things that, that Jen and myself have been talking about, this fact that we can just share out content between things. We don't have to do all these calculations. That's fantastic. But the minute you start to use that, you run into the constructs and the algorithms that that stuff is based on. And they seem quite confusing compared to good old percentages where we knew how big everything was. And so one of the objections I get against grid layout, people say, well, you can do all of this stuff using Flexbox. And you can. You can fake a grid with Flexbox just like you can with floats by restricting the flexibility of Flexbox and giving everything percentage widths again, going back to doing the calculations yourself. Now, it's an improvement uh, over floats because you don't need to do any clearing, and we can take advantage of all that nice alignment stuff that Flexbox has. But you're still faking a grid by lining things up. And that's really important if you're transitioning to new layout. There's this difference in layout models. The fact that with grid layout, we actually have a grid into which we can put things. Everything that came before involves us faking a grid by lining things up and pushing them around. So this new world of, of sizing, it brings a whole bunch of new challenges uh, because this all starts to seem quite complicated. And so I'm going to have a look at this new world of sizing. And I'm going to have a look at something that's pretty much impossible to say on stage, CSS intrinsic and extrinsic sizing, which is the specification that details exactly how big that box is. It deals with the intrinsic size of things. That's the size their content would have them be if nothing on the outside was influencing them. It deals with the extrinsic size of things, and that's the size they are based on external things, sort of a parent element perhaps restricting the size. 
So if we just think about a basic string of text and see how that acts. So I've got a div here, and inside we've got some text, and I'll give the div a border so that we can see what it looks like. Now a div is a block level element, and so if we don't give it a width, it's going to stretch all the way out in the inline dimension as far as it can go. So as wide as the viewport or any container that you've put it in, that's what's providing the size for the item. An external thing is causing the box to be a certain size. Now I could ask my box to be a certain size. I could say, right, I want you to be 500 pixels. And that will make it 500 pixels in the inline direction like this. But the content of our box also has a size. And perhaps we'd like that content to say how big we want the box to be, rather than something external constraining it. So the maximum size of this string would be if it didn't wrap at all. So it stretches out in one line, it doesn't wrap at all, and that's as big as it can get. So that's its max content size. That's as big as that content will be. And a string also has a minimum size. If it wraps everywhere possible, gets as small as it can be, which in the case of a string is going to be the longest word in the string, so it takes all of the soft wrapping opportunities it can, that's its min content size. And we can actually ask boxes to display like this using some new keywords that are in CSS. Um, these are implemented in Chrome, and they're prefixed currently in Firefox. Uh, but these are coming in, into CSS. So we can say, make my width min content. And our content takes all of those soft wrapping opportunities. It gets as small in the inline direction as it can. And we can use max content. And then the opposite happens. It just gets as big as it can be, and then that box stops. But max content, what's going to happen if the string gets longer than whatever it's in? Well, it's going to overflow. It's going to force an overflow there. So I put my box here into a fixed width container. So the outer container, which gives us the available width, is set to 20m. The box inside is set to max content. And so you can see what happens here. We get an overflow situation. And that's generally not what you want. You don't want things sort of bursting out of their boxes, which is why on the web, if you put some content into a box, by default, it's going to wrap. It's not going to go to its max content size unless you ask it to. So you know, this might seem a little bit academic. You might find these content keywords useful themselves in certain types of layout. But it becomes really important to know that this is going on once we're dealing with flex and grid layouts. Because a lot of the confusion around sizing in those layouts is because it's difficult to understand how that space is being distribu distributed. And it all comes down to these concepts of sizing. So let's have a look at Flexbox. So I've got some content here. I've got a div of the class of box and some items sat inside it. So the wrapper there is going to become a flex container, and the items will do what flex items do. By, by default, they display as a row. And each of the items will try to go to max content size if it can, and if they've got enough space in the container to do so. So we end up with this. So the top line there. The flex container size is the dotted line, and we've got the four items, and they go to max content size, and there's plenty of space for them to lay out. In fact, there's a bit of space at the end. But if we look at the second, we've got more content in one, and so our items have actually gone to min content size, and then the other one's got a bit bigger, and the text is all just sort of fitted in. So how does Flexbox work this out? Well, it starts from max content, which is what you can see in the top uh, screenshot. It starts from max content size. And then it sort of tries to add all of the items. And then it knows it can't add all of that content at max content size. It's going to overflow the box. And so it starts removing space from the items. And it removes less space from the larger item because the default for Flexbox is to have a flex basis of auto. And that looks at the content size as the flex basis. So the bigger item gets less space as being removed. And the smaller items are never going to drink smaller than them in content size, otherwise they might disappear. So they, it won't completely disappear. Um, so once they've gone to min content, everything else gets taken out of the larger box. Now, if you want to control this behavior, you use the flex properties. So here I've said flex one, one auto. So here I'm saying you can grow and you can shrink from auto. So because we're saying from auto, the top boxes, they've all got about the same amount of text in. And so we end it with what looks like four equal boxes.
boxes because they can all grow and there was space at the end so it's been shared out between the items. But the second one hasn't changed at all because we didn't have any extra space. There was no growing going on at all. We're actually shrinking in that case. If what you wanted was that second box to have equal size columns no matter what space was in there, you'd need to go flex one, one, zero. That's making your flex basis zero. So then we're going, whatever space is in this container, share it out equally, because I'm working for a flex basis of zero. And then if we take that algorithm and we go and have a look at grid layout, we see there's a slight difference. So the top screenshot here is the flex items, um, and we've got the ones at min content size, and then the last one taking the space. Now, if we do this with grid, you see that the, item, the small items actually go to max content size. Now, the first time I saw this, I was completely puzzled. I didn't know what was going on. Why is Flexbox and Grid different? And it's because in Grid layout, the algorithm works by taking the min content size and adding space, whereas Flexbox works by taking the max content size and removing space. So in a Grid context, our small items get space added rather than having it taken away. Now, you might never run into those differences, but if you do, understanding there's an algorithm under the hood, it's in the spec, it says how this behaves. And so having so, so some idea that that's what's happening can make all of this seem an awful lot less mysterious. And it's in just understanding these little things by creating kind of test cases and trying it out, that's where you get your superpowers with layout. That's where you stop seeing it as being mysterious. And I'm just like, oh, hang on. Let me just go and look at what the spec says here. So now we've got some idea of, of one of the things that might be going on with layout. We can have a look at the various ways to play with sizing in our grids. So those content keywords can be used to set track sizes, and that's implemented everywhere. Um, they're only prefixed for just strings of text in Firefox. So everywhere that we've got grid layout, we can use the min and max content keywords. So we're using them here to set a track size. And I'm creating four column tracks at min content size, which gives me something that looks like this. So you can see that the item four that's got all the text in, it's wrapped as much as it can and got as small as it can to make the track size. And if you want to make your track as big as it possibly can be, which of course might cause an overflow, you could use max content. And if you've only got small amounts of text, you can see that the items there have sort of gone into the grid and they've just stayed there, max content size, they've not spread out. But then if we look at the second screenshot, we've got something that's got lots of text in, it's caused an enormous track and it's broke out and it's overflowing everywhere. And so we've got a really interesting keyword we can use to sort of stop this behavior and get max content, but with a limit. And that's called fit content. Now, fit content is just like max content until it gets to the size that you've passed in. So inside the brackets there, I've got 15 CH. That's 15 characters. So what I'm saying there is be max content until you get to 15 characters, and then please stop and just start wrapping at that point. So all of those tracks are sized with fit content, 15 CH. You can see the top ones, none of them ever get to 15 characters, so that's exactly as it was before. They're at max content. In the second one, a lot of our items are just max content. They don't get to 15 characters, so they've gone to max content. The final track hits 15 characters, starts wrapping. So that's fit content. Really, really useful. And so the reason to kind of start knowing about this stuff is that you know, you can absolutely still make a 12-column grid with CSS grid layout if that's what you want to do. And if you're adding grid elements to an existing design, that may be exactly what you want to do. The nice thing is that that 12-column grid will be a much simpler construction than what went before. So it will be much easier to use. It shouldn't take too long to do. So we could make a grid using FR units and fixed width gaps. And the nice thing with the FR units is you can have fixed width gaps if you want, because grid will take away the fixed width items before it sort of works out the rest of the size for the rest. And that means you can also use fixed width tracks if you want. And grid will just take away the fixed width items before distributing the space. And so this is all we need if we want to do a 12 column grid layout with CSS grid. Um, we set up our tracks, and then we find the things that we want to do spanning with, and we just say how many tracks we want them to span. 
And often people say, oh, I don't want fixed width gaps, actually. I'd like to have percentage gaps. And you can still have percentage gaps if that's what you want, and then just use the FR units to uh, work out the rest of the sizing. Really, the main reason to use percentages in grid layout uh, is if you are trying to fit grid components into a layout where you've already got other layout types. If you're trying to line them up with floats or with flexbox, you're trying to add a component into your design, then you've probably used percentages for those other elements. And so using percentages in grid will let everything line up and look nice and neat. Um, if you're building a new thing, then the FR unit pretty much gets rid of the need to calculate percentages. Uh, but you can use percentages if you want to, or if it works with the sort of thing you're trying to do. Certainly don't obsess over what is right or wrong. Uh, all of this stuff's defined in the spec. It's all fine to do. Experiment, see what works in your use case. And remember that you don't need to stick to that 12-column grid. Uh, this quote's from an article about rebuilding Slack, and Slack.com, and they were saying, well, they thought they'd start out with a 12-column grid, and then they realized they didn't need to. They could look at patterns in the layout and build those instead. And this is something I really enjoy doing. Here's a little example. A media object. So you're going to put an image in there, and you're going to use a sort of responsive image. It's, you're going to use max width 100%. So you don't want the image to get bigger than, say, 300 pixels. Even if it's bigger than that, it should stop at 300 pixels. But if you put a very little image in, say an icon, you just want it to take up as much space as it needs. You don't want to have a big gap between it and the text. And you can do that with one component and without needing to sort of add classes for bigger or smaller images by using fit content. So what I'm saying here is the first column, fit content, max at 300 pixels. Don't get bigger than 300 pixels. And then the rest, the other side, is 1FR. Now, 1FR will just take up whatever space is left. And that will give us that display of, if you put a little icon in, it's only 100 pixels. Well, that first track is not going to get to 300 pixels. And then the rest of the space is taken up. But if you do put a big image in, it'll get sized back down to 300 pixels. So it makes these very flexible little components. And other things we can do, we can create these very precise looking layouts with elements that expand if the content needs them to by using min-max. So here's some grid code. I've just got three very simple columns. I've got two 1FR columns and then one 3FR column. So that's going to be a, a bigger column at the end. And then my rows, I'm using min-max and using a pixel size and then auto. So that pixel size is becoming a minimum size. That track is not going to be smaller than that pixel size. Auto means it's going to grow with the content. So we're never going to get an overflow situation or things overlapping each other. So here we've got this layout. It's a single grid. The multi-column layout on the side is in that 3FR column. The second row has got a minimum size of 50 pixels, but it's got content in it that's taller than 50 pixels, so it grows because its maximum is auto. And it's worth remembering, it's a two-dimensional layout model, so that is going to grow right across the row. Now, there's a gap between the second and third images there, and that's a minimum of 50 pixels plus the grid gap. Now, obviously, if we added text in there, that would grow, but it's also going to grow if we get text on the other side. So if that multi-column element gets more text in, well, the row there needs to expand to allow for the text across the other side of the grid, two-dimensional layout. Rows can't grow in one place only. They're going to stretch everywhere. So this is pretty cool. It lets you create these sort of very precise-looking layouts that don't blow up when they get more stuff in them than you were expecting when you made the design. So it's pretty cool. So all this stuff about sizing, you know, it, it's not particularly exciting when you're sort of looking into it. But it's when you start playing around with how this lets you create new design patterns, it really pays off. I think learning about these core things, it's a bit like the sort of CSS equivalent of eating your vegetables and getting enough sleep. You know, by doing that, you can then do all the other things, all the other neat things that you want to do. And if you write CSS or you design things that are built with CSS, now is the time to really look at sizing. It's going to be incredibly important for all the new stuff that is coming in. So we've looked at a little bit of grid layout. And something else that gets into my inbox are people saying, this is very complicated. Why are there all these properties? Why is all this stuff being made? Why are you making it so difficult? And actually, that's a general problem with software development. 
Uh, I have a CMS product. And people want it to do everything, but also be really easy. So that's the same with CSS and, and anything on the web platform. You know, people would like everything to work, but they want it to be very, very simple. And unfortunately, it's a fact of life that the more things we make it possible to do, it does bring in some complexity. And yes, there are a whole bunch of properties in the CSS grid spec. And then you add to that, there's all the things in box alignment and sizing, and it can look very overwhelming. But it's worth remembering that you don't need to learn all of it. You don't need to learn all of it at once. You can learn the bits that work for you today. And also, many features of Grid are actually just a different way of doing the same thing. In order that Grid fits into different layouts and different ways that people are working with layout on the web, and you'll find that once you've switched your mind to a kind of grid way of thinking, it actually just starts to become a bit clearer. You start seeing things you need to solve and looking at the spec and seeing how that's going to fit in. And even with the apparent multitude of ways to lay things out on the grid, there's one thing that's actually key. It's just lines. Everything sits upon a grid of lines. You need to understand grid lines. You need to understand how things are placed between those lines. The other methods are essentially sugar on top of that. So we'll have a look at what I mean by that. This is a very simple grid. This is what we're building. The actual grid container is the dotted line. We've got a purple block that is in the middle. So if we actually looked at the grid lines, we've got something like this. So I've got five column tracks there. Um, and four row tracks, which gives me five row lines. We have one on the end, and six column lines. We've got the one on the end. And I'm working in English, so column line one starts on the left and numbers across the grid, and column, uh, row line one starts at the top and numbers down. So this is how we position our item. This is the definition. We've got a very fixed sort of grid there. We're using FR units for the columns and just pixels for the rows. And then I'm positioning it between like, column line two and five and grid row two, and four. Now, I could name some of the lines. So I think I'm going to name my lines, and I'm going to name them content-start and content-end. And I'm going to use the same name for row and column start and end. So this is how we do that. So we name the lines within the square brackets, and then we just swap the numbers for the names when we place the item. So that's using the names. Now, this gets interesting in that you don't need to call the lines something dash star and something dash n. That's up to you. You could call them anything you like. But if you do, you get a named area of the main named name you used. So because you've got content dash start and content dash end for both rows and columns, you're going to get an area, and it's going to be called content. And so rather than place the item via named lines, we could use the grid area property to place the item. So I'm still defining the lines. I've got content start and content end for columns and for rows. And then when I get to the item, instead of using the named lines, I just say grid area content. And that will give me the exact same layout. But the thing is, grid area content is really this. It's grid area content, 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 content. Because grid area is a shorthand. It's a shorthand for all of the lines. So the order of the lines in the shorthand are grid row start, grid column start, grid row end, and grid column end. And the reason they're all set to content is that when you've got a grid area, which we created from the lines named content start and content end, you also get line names created by that grid area of the main name used. So if you say grid column start content, that will be the start edge of the area named content. And if you say grid column end content, that's going to be the end edge of the area named content. So that's how that resolves. The same for columns and for rows. So each of our lines has now got two names that we're aware of. So we've got content start and end. We specified those. That's in our definition. We've also got these lines named content, which resolved the start and end of the area. And this is how the shorthand works. We can say grid area content due to some specific wording in the spec about what happens if you don't declare all four lines. And that's pretty much how all shorthands work. 
Uh, if we don't do everything that could be done in the shorthand, in the specification, it'll say what happens to the other things that you haven't set. So here we've got all of four items set. But if we specified only three of them, so here we're missing out grid column end, grid column end gets set to the same as grid column start. So we know that content resolves to the start and end edge. So that works out fine. They're both set to content, so that means they go to the start and end edge. And so if we specify only two, so here we've missed out grid column end and grid row end, so they now both resolve to the same as their start edge, which means they go to the end edge of the same area. And of course, if we drop three of them, well, then everything is now just set to the same value as grid row start, which is why grid area content works at all. It's just a shorthand. It's just a shorthand for four lines. And to complete the picture, we can create a named area using grid template areas. So we don't name any lines at this point. What I'm doing here is I'm creating that content area on my grid using this kind of ASCII art method of doing layout with CSS grid layout. So you can see there I've got my grid. The empty cells are shown as a, as a period. And then we've got the content, content, content. That's the little box in the middle. And then we're saying grid area content. That's where we want it to go. So we've created an area called content, and now we have lines named content because we've created that area, and we know that if you create an area, you get a line which is named the same as the area. But we also have something else. Now, if I wanted to position something on the grid using the named lines, perhaps I want to put something here. I can't use grid column start content because that would put it after the first content line, because that would resolve to the start of the area. We know that. So that would go into that first content cell if I did that. And in this example, I don't have the named lines that I created in the first example, because I've created the named area using grid template areas. Or do we? Well, in fact, we do, because it all works in reverse. So if you create an area with grid template areas, you will get a named line of the main name you used plus dash dot and dash end. So we basically go back to what we had in the first place, which means we can position our item using grid row content start and grid column content end. So that's what it looks like. So we've not named those lines. They've been created for us by grid layout, which would let us put the item there. And this code's all online. You can poke around with it. If you use the uh, Firefox grid inspector, you'll be able to see sort of what's going on there. So it is just a grid of lines. And if, when you're playing around with it, if things start appearing in odd places, just going back to, well, what does grid think it's doing with this? What line does it think it's on? That's really the place to start. And if you don't like any of those layout methods, you don't have to use them. They're a choice that you have. You can use them if you want to. You can say, I don't like this. It's confusing, and not use it at all. And this is the thing. We actually do have choice about how we do layout pretty much for the first time. And so if you're starting a brand new project right now, take a good hard look at what's available to you. See what you might want to use. See what works with your team and what you don't like using. Forget your assumptions based on what wasn't possible last year. Things have really changed. You know, what's the best method for achieving a particular design pattern? Can we come up with a brand new design pattern, something that's just unusual that we don't normally use on the web because we haven't been able to in the past? And certainly, we can get away from which patterns does the framework give us. We don't just have to pick from a selection of options anymore. And we don't have a set of technical limitations that we've had for a very, very long time. And all of this is very nice. But I know that there'll be a lot of you thinking, because I, I get comments, I talk to people after, after shows like this, a lot of you are thinking, well, this is fine if you work on a shiny new thing, if you can, you've got the luxury of working on new code, but I work on an existing thing. I have old code. So who has code in their product, CSS in your project, that was written more than five years ago? Hands up. More than 10 years ago? Tables for layout? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, we work on things that have been around for a long time. In fact, when I did the survey, you know, about 8% of people working on existing projects had code in the code base that had been written more than 10 years ago. So standing up and sort of saying, oh, you can use all this marvelous new stuff, that's all very well. 
But how does it work if you're just working on components in a bigger system? And here's the thing. The existence of ancient CSS in your code base does not stop you using new CSS. If you need to add maybe a component, perhaps a new feature of the site, you're, you're building some little contained feature of the site, it's going to have to sit in that big framework that's been around forever and you wish you could change, but you can't. It's, it's going to have to stay. But you, you can, you've got a bit of flexibility with what you do with this new thing you're introducing. And this is where understanding new CSS comes really useful, kind of really understanding how things are going to inherit, what might leak through into your component if you play around with it. If you've figured out sizing, you can kind of play a few tricks to make sure that you can use new CSS in a very tidy way without needing to rebuild everything. Now, I'm kind of expecting that my next slide is going to result in all the other speakers kind of racing on stage and dragging me off, because here is Bootstrap on the event part stage. And this is a two-column layout. And the reason I'm using Bootstrap, it's actually old Bootstrap as well. It's Bootstrap with floats. And the reason I'm using this is because this is pretty much like, you know, the sort of layouts people have. You've got a floated layout framework that you use on your site. Uh, so this is just using absolutely standard Bootstrap uh, version 3 with a floated grid. And I've used the Bootstrap grid to position the sidebar and, and the main content there. And I did this because I wanted an off-the-shelf thing. I didn't want my customized floated layout that I knew was going to be fine. I wanted just like generic bootstrap. Because then I wanted to put my CSS grid component in it. And this component uses all of the nice things about grid. It's using autoflow dense, we're spanning rows. It all resizes if it goes if it's smaller, of course, you know, bootstrap's um, responsive. So if it does all collapse down, that will resize nicely. It's a little gallery, it's a grid component, it's popped inside a bootstrap layout and nothing blew up. It worked really well. So we can take advantage of grid layout. We don't actually need to rewrite everything. You can kind of take baby steps into using this stuff. And this is all the CSS I needed to create that component, which is pretty nice. You know, it can create these things an awful lot more quickly. We can take advantage of that it's just a lot faster building things with grid and do things that weren't possible before, but we don't need to throw everything away. But if you are in the position of starting a new thing or a section of a thing, and you've got a bit more sort of freedom there, you know, start looking at the components of your site and deciding, well, you know, how are we going to work on this? How are we going to create things that we can use right across our team? And something I've found that People get very excited about grid, and they're like, yeah, we're going to do everything with CSS grid layout, and forget that actually there are still use cases for the old ones. We haven't removed floats from CSS. And I remember seeing this when, sort of way back when, I've been doing this a long time, and when we moved from people laying things out with tables to CSS, people got the idea that tables were evil. And so they started rebuilding tabular data using a set of divs and creating these utter horrors, saying, why doesn't this work? And you're like, because you should be using a table. And I've had a number of conversations with people who are literally trying to invent floats by using grid. So if you want the wrapping behavior of a float, please use a float. If you don't, then use Flexbox or grid layout. You know, you've, you've got these things at your disposal. Don't forget the older stuff exists. Multiple column layout. I use this a lot for, you know, I do a lot of UI design, so I'm sort of, you know, dealing with a user interface. I've got a great big long string of checkboxes. I just want to collapse it down. I want as many columns as will fit, and it should all be responsive. Multiple column layout, really useful for that kind of thing. It's not just for laying out a newspaper. Flexbox, I've got a bunch of things. I just want to space them out, or I want the things to equally absorb space. That's a flex layout, single dimension. So you don't need you know, to use grid for absolutely everything because you've learned how to use it and you think it's the best thing. It is the best thing ever. But there are other things that are useful in your layouts, and it's building the stuff and using it all together. And I think you know, something that's happened as we've relied a lot on frameworks and other people's code is we're kind of absorbing the solutions for problems we don't have into our own projects because off-the-shelf code has to be incredibly generic. It has to solve a lot of problems. And those problems quite often are not your problems. And you can essentially replace the convenience of having something like Bootstrap or Foundation or some other framework with your own layout utilities. And you know, Grid and, and the other sort of things we've got to play with actually make that an awful lot easier. 
And so instead of inheriting the rest of the world's CSS problems, you can just deal with the actual problems that you have. And I've been sort of actually doing this stuff. Now I can actually use grid in production. I'm working on something at the moment, and we've got an awful lot of, sort of different size things to lay out. And they suit different layout methods. So sometimes I want multi-call, sometimes I want grid, sometimes I want flexbox, but I'd like them all to line up with each other. I don't want a multi-call element to have a bigger gap than the, the grid element, for example. I want them all to look nice and solid and look like one cohesive thing, because people looking at the website do not care whether I've used grid or multi-call or whatever. So I wondered if it would be possible to create a SAS mix in that I could throw a layout type at and an ideal size, and it would just work that all out for me. So here it is. If you don't use SAS, it might look a bit obscure, but basically all I'm doing, I've got, I've got a SAS mix in here called gridded. I pass it a type of layout, grid, flex, or multi-call, plus some information about the size I'm aiming for, for the tracks, flex items, or columns, and the gaps between them. And then it creates my CSS, and the flex output is actually what makes it look complicated, because you have to add things to the flex item itself. And then I use it like this. So I can just sort of pass in, and, and if anyone else is working on that, I say, oh, well, if you want, if you think this should be multi-call, pass in multi-call. If you want grid, pass in grid. And then we get layouts that work a bit like this, and they all match. Now, the, the code's online. You can have a play around with it, but it's very specific to something I'm doing. It may or may not be useful for you, but that's kind of the point. You don't need to lean on someone else's framework you know, come up with your own stuff. Come up with tools and utilities that work for your team and the sort of problems you're solving, rather than just sort of looking for somebody else to do that. I think this is so much easier to do now. You can play with stuff in such an easier way that it's kind of worth doing a bit of that. And so it's kind of come to the point of the talk where I need to talk about browsers. Because if I don't talk about browsers now, you're going to come and talk about browsers to me later. <laughs> so, in 2006, I, like, I do like to go back there. It's my age. You kind of start to get to a point where you have to keep thinking about the past. But 2006, so over 10 years ago, Yahoo, who, believe it or not, at the time, had many of the leading minds of the web working for them, they published this chart in a blog post written by Nate Ketchley, and it detailed something called graded browser support. And it was a companion to the Yahoo user interface library, which was just a fairly early kind of framework-like thing. Um, and they'd made that available for people, and people were using it. And graded browser support basically explained the choices they'd made. And they categorized browsers. They categorized them into modern browsers, which at the time included IE6. It was a long time ago, uh, which would get all of the features that were included in YUI. And then there were ancient browsers, which would get a simpler experience. And then there were these sort of Browsers that we don't know about, unusual experimental browsers, browser X. We don't really know about those, but they probably exist. And they updated this quarterly, and they removed browsers and moved them around uh, you know, as, as it, it made sense. Now, this was actually really useful, because I think a lot of conversations about browser support, and this goes right back to like Netscape 4 and us using CSS for layout for the first time. These conversations happen with a lack of understanding on one side. Your client, your boss, your team member doesn't really understand that it's possible to support old browsers but not have a website that looks identical in old browsers. And that lack of understanding meets a kind of lack of confidence. The developer kind of knows it's possible. That people have said it's possible, you know, that it, it should be possible to make this good experience, but perhaps they don't have the resources or the examples or just the confidence to assert the arguments. And the graded browser support kind of gave people that. You could go to your client and you could say, hey, look, Yahoo says this browser is now C grade. And they're the most traffic website on the internet, which they were at the time. They weren't targeting techies. They had all of the data. Uh, so it was a really good way to make that argument. And I think that's why it was sort of so popular. And people really used that quite a lot with clients. It gave a sort of a, a level of confidence that maybe they didn't have before. But the thing is, I think, as you build confidence in your CSS skills and in dealing with these things and knowing that you're not going to blow stuff up all over the place, it's not going to be a terrible experience, you're not going to have people calling up and saying, why does the website look awful? You find it a lot easier to make a case for using new techniques. And in fact, you'll probably find you often don't even need to make a case. You can just kind of do it. And because no one's going to complain about it, it'll be fine. You're supporting the business aims, people are using the website for what it's for, and everything should be fine. 
So just looking at our browsers, um, this tends to mean Internet Explorer for most people. With my survey, 39% of people said i11 was the oldest IE they supported. If we add i10 to that, 63% of people were saying i10 and up. Now, you can use Grid with i10 and 11. You have to use the older MS prefix version, but it's possible to do a sort of simpler grid layout for those browsers. And for other desktop browsers, supporting the last two versions seemed a very common thing. People are saying, we support the last two versions of Chrome, the last two versions of Firefox. And we know about old browsers, and you can code around lack of support. We've got things like feature queries and so on. But there are browsers that might never get grid layout, or well, we don't really know about them, we don't know what they're going to do. So let's add a few more browsers to our Can I Use chart. Now, the key browser I want you to look at here, I've sort of added some, so we don't have quite as much green to be pleased about, and the key browser to look at there is UC Browser. Who's heard of UC Browser? Right, okay. So about 8% of people are using UC Browser. And when I was researching this, in September 2017, StatCount reported that UC Browser had 35% of the traffic in India, coming second only to Chrome. And so that's what I want to talk about when it comes to browsers that don't support Grid. A lot of those browsers are mobile browsers. UC Browser is, is predominantly a mobile browser. I think they've got a desktop version, but it's generally used as a mobile browser. And a lot of those browsers are popular in areas of the world where data is very expensive and they are using devices that are much less powerful than the iPhone or the nice Android that you have. And so I wanted to call that out because of something I hear over and over again. It came up in my survey. It comes up in conversations wherever I go. People are looking for the magic grid polyfill. You know, they want something they could just drop in and it would just fix all the problems. Grid will just work on anything and it will be marvellous. But please don't look for this. Because if you're looking for that, if you're trying to write that, if you're trying to find it, if you're trying to kind of patch Grid into browsers that don't support Grid, you are forcing a load of JavaScript onto less capable devices. The very worst place you can be putting it. You know, in this search for a magic polyfill, it misses a key point of these new layout methods. They give us this amazing opportunity to create lighter, quicker, and less expensive in real monetary terms for much of the world layouts. We can create really complex layout with a few lines of CSS. And what this means is we can actually use shiny new CSS to make the web better for people who don't support the new CSS, which I think is pretty cool. So CSS is developing features to make this easier. You know, we've got feature queries. We don't need to load in Modernizer like we used to. We don't need to load in a load of JavaScript to check for features anymore. We've got feature queries. And all the browsers that support Grid support feature queries. You can use them to test for it and then do whatever you want to do. We don't need to sniff for browser versions. Now, of course, if you were all sniffing for browser versions, pretty much none of you knew about UC Browser, so you wouldn't have been looking for it anyway. So we can use CSS alone to enhance CSS. So that's pretty cool. And the nice thing about feature queries is that when this happens, which is the fact that UC Browser is actually going to be updating to support Grid soon, all those people are going to get your cool new layout without needing to download anything new or do anything. It's just going to happen. Once their browser updates, wow, your site looks even better for them. That's fantastic. They're not having to load anything extra. But it's worth remembering with this tweet as we celebrate another browser with Grid, now, you know, I'm certainly celebrating that. It'd be great to have more coverage of Grid layout. Okay, so you see browser will get Grid, but there will always be Browser X. There will always be the unknown. And it probably will be a browser you don't know about that isn't something that you see very often. And by using our new methods responsibly, we get to support that browser and its users wherever they are. Our new layout methods are really elegant. They work well with feature queries. They're also designed in themselves to overwrite older layout methods. So if you use floats, you can overwrite that stuff with Grid or with Flexbox. And because we can do that in such a few lines of CSS, it's really not going to impact the people who only see the older version and don't get the Grid version. So by using your skills in layout, the new skills you're developing in layout, you can start out by creating a very simple experience for mobile browsers and for limited browsers. 
with a few lines of CSS. You turn on your fancy new grid layout. You turn on all the stuff that, you've, that you really want it to be for the majority of people who are coming to your site who are going to see that. And those few lines of code, you know, they're not causing a problem to the limited devices. What will cause them a problem is you loading in a whole bunch of JavaScript in an attempt to make the fancy layout work on the limited device. That's probably just going to create a bad experience. And so being able to do all the cool new stuff that we've got coming into CSS, you know, it's great, and I'm really excited about it. I wouldn't be going around talking about this stuff if I wasn't. I, you know, I really enjoy seeing all the new stuff and seeing what people are doing with it and having conversations with people and finding out what you're doing. I love it. Being able to save developer time is really important. You know, we've all got business goals to meet, and if we can use new CSS and it saves us a whole bunch of time working things out and in helping the rest of our team understand how things work, that's brilliant too. These are really good things. But making the web available to everyone, that's exciting. It has to be key. I don't want to be creating cool things for rich people. I want to be able to play a little part in a web that really is for everyone. I want a web that enables someone in India who has a very limited feature phone but can access all of the learning that I can access, who can get that stuff, who can then become involved. That's really important. I want that to happen. It's never, ever been about the new shiny for me, for sort of its own sake. I think if it had, I would have got bored an awful long time ago because that kind of glittery stuff, you know, it, it's fun at first, but that's not what this has to be about. And so I'm going to wrap up by going back to that question that I asked in my survey, and I got all those terribly downbeat responses of miserable people. But I'm glad to say they weren't the only responses, and in fact, they weren't the majority of responses. There were a lot of people who basically said they were excited. And that's exactly where I'd like you to be when you look at this stuff. Don't be overwhelmed by it. It's all something you can learn. And also, I think that Jen's talk coming up next will really dig into some of the things that you can be excited about and some of the things you can think about building. So I think you'll really enjoy that. And thank you very much for listening.